trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. He shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Fall blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord. Terrestrial ball to him, all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him, all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord. Before the opening to the sun above, melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. For Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and cleansed every saint. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Wow. You'd think Church of Christ people wouldn't be afraid of a little water. Kind of slim out there today, isn't it? But it's the quality, courageous people who are here. So <laughs> glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. Hey, if you're a guest, welcome to Twickenham. We're glad to have you this morning. We are always looking for new family members. And if you're looking for a new church, we'd love to talk with you about what God's doing in your life. We can share what he's doing in our church. 
and it would be interesting to see where those stories come together. Really glad you're here. So later on in this service, Shane Basham's going to lead us in the Lord's Supper meditation when we approach communion. That's a time in our service when we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We take a small piece of bread and a small amount of grape juice to remember his body and his blood. If you've never done that before, you can just kind of watch it and observe it. And you're welcome to participate in that if you'd like to and to think about what he means to you. So we're just, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later in the service. You may have already noticed that we're sort of going old school with the music today. A couple of reasons for that. One is it's good to remember that these were the songs, the songs that we're going to sing this morning, the old ones, I think the next one is like from 1873. These were the songs the old people complained about back then, okay? (laughs) So this is what the young whippersnappers were singing in the 1870s or the 1730s or whatever. And trust me, that's exactly what was going on. People were complaining about it. The other reason that we wanted to sing these is because this morning the message is going to center around a guy that was 85 years old, 85 years old. In fact, he was the oldest man in his nation, and yet he was the most faithful and the most ready to go and do battle for the Lord. And so in honor of Caleb, the 85-year-old warrior, we're singing old songs today. All right, let me ask you to stand and let's hear this word of the Lord together from uh, the book of Romans as we think about this assurance that we have that we're going to sing about in this next song. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a blessed assurance. Glad you're here. Let's praise the Lord together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my soul, praising my Savior all day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting. Above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. He leadeth me. Oh, blessed thought, oh, words with heavenly comfort from. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own.
remain standing for our scripture reading this morning. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Be seated as we take our offering this morning. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sent from the Father and it thrills my soul just to feel and to that his blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me. Yes, his grace reaches me. And twill last through eternity. Now I'm under his control. mine today though my sins were as scarlet he has washed them away his grace reaches me yes his grace reaches me and will last through And I'm happy in my soul just to know that His grace reaches me. God is merciful. He has chosen not to punish us when it was well within his rights. He has given to us when he could have taken. He has given us life when we, when we received or rather deserved death. Let's read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I'll be reading from the ESV. And you were dead in the tres trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God, by his mercy, has made us alive. He saved us. He's lifted us, and he's even allowed us to be seated with him. Not only that, he has made us his workmanship. We are his pride and joy. But he did this at the cost of his son and himself. As we take the bread and the juice this morning, let's think about God's mercy. Let's think about his steadfast love. Let's think of his awesome grace and his incredible gifts. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we continue our praise to you this morning. We thank you for being so merciful to us uh, that you could have punished it. it punished us for a multitude of things, but you chose against it. You took on that punishment yourself by allowing your son to die. We're so thankful for that, God. You have you've just tremendously blessed us and given so much to us. This morning as we take the bread, uh, at this moment we take the bread, we ask that you would uh, lead us back to the cross, that we would remember your son's body that he gave, uh, that, the incredible sacrifice there. God, we ask that you would fill us uh, with the emotion, the, the thoughts, uh, let us truly feel that sacrifice and the gift that it brings for us and the grace that you, sh- that you have shown us. And we pray to your son. Amen.
Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Let's pray again. Our God in heaven, we continue our thanks to you, our praise to you. You, you God, are above all. You're the greatest. Uh, you're the greatest giver. You have given the greatest sacrifice. You're the most merciful. You're, you're full of more grace than we can imagine. You are love. You've shown us your steadfast love. And you're faithful to us. And at this moment, as we think about the blood that your son shed, we ask that uh, you would strengthen us that you would show to us that your faithfulness and that we likewise would be encouraged to be faithful to you. It's through your son we again pray. Amen. grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace God's praise 
Would you believe me if I told you that you were one decision away from a dramatically different life? Every morning, when you slip from sleep into the day, even before you roll over to see what time it is or fumble to find the snooze button on your phone or your alarm clock or whatever device you use to get you out of bed, you are one decision away from experiencing a divine adventure. Tomorrow, you will will turn your car into a slot at work or school. You'll shift it into park. You'll turn off the ignition. You'll pull down the, the visor for one last look in the mirror to check your makeup or to see if that razor neck is still bleeding. And you'll reach for the handle to open the door. In that instant... Just as you step out of your car onto the pavement to head into your office or the plant or the shop or school, you will decide whether your life that day will be average or astonishing. Sometime this week, you are going to be just doing the next thing, heading to class, walking the hall to another office sitting down to order lunch or breakfast or dinner at your favorite restaurant, and all of a sudden you're going to have an opportunity to change somebody's day. It may be as simple as a kind word or as spectacular as telling them about the one who can save their souls. But in that moment, you will decide to either keep drifting or that it's time for you to make a difference. You and I are always one decision away from a dramatically different life. What is that decision? I'll tell you in a minute. I want you to look in Joshua chapter 14 with me. Joshua chapter 14. This part of the book of Joshua falls into a section that is about as interesting as the real estate archives of the county courthouse. That's because basically, that's what this section is. It's a record of which of the 12 tribes of Israel got which parcels of land in Canaan. It's the property deeds. But but in between the riveting record of the land allotments to the tribes of Manasseh and Judah, There's a story about a man named Caleb, and we're going to read verses 6 through 9 in in, uh, Joshua chapter 14. Uh, Now, the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, It's it's a town, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions, but my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. And then Caleb adds... I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. You know, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when you think about what kind of person do you want to be 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now? You got to wonder what Joshua was thinking when he was 40 years old. 
what kind of man do I want to be in 45 years? Well, this is the kind of man he is. Joshua and Caleb would have been the two oldest men in Israel at the time, older than all the others by 20 years at least. And there's a story behind that. And that story begins with one promise, 12 spies, 40 days, and two opinions. So where would you go to find the story like that? The book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. God tells Moses, who was Israel's leader at the time, the part of the story that we're in right now, Joshua is the leader, but back then Moses was the leader. God told Moses to send some men to explore the land of Canaan. And and what he said was, and the phrasing is important, what he said was, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. This would be the same God who just a few months earlier had devastated Egypt with the 10 plagues. Some of you who really enjoyed the songs that we sang this morning saw the movie with Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner. Others of you saw the uh, animated version with Val Kilmer and Danny Glover, and still others, the movie with Christian Bale and Ben Kingsley. Whichever movie you saw, God, and some of you may have actually been there when this happened, God wiped out Egypt and let his people go. Then the God who tells Israel, who tells Moses, this is the land I am giving the Israelites, this is the same God that parted the Red Sea so Israel could pass through on dry ground. Do you remember the movie in Bruce Almighty, that scene in Bruce Almighty when Bruce parts the tomato soup? Kind of like that. God does that. And then God led Israel through the wilderness with a cloud by day and a column of fire by night. And then God gave them water from a rock in the desert, and he fed them every morning with a flaky power breakfast biscuit called manna. God has been taking care of Israel so faithfully. And now he says, I am giving you this land. Do you know what that whole exploring the land thing was really all about? It was not a reconnaissance mission. God didn't send the 12 spies in so that they can figure out the enemy's weaknesses or discover the best route for attack or to discern what the enemy's um, uh, moral uh, state was. This was. This was not a reconnaissance mission. This was like when a real estate agent puts a sign up in the yard on the Sunday afternoon between 2 and 4. This was open house. I think God was so excited about giving his people a home that he wanted these guys to go in, see how awesome it was going to be, come back and tell everybody so that everybody would be all pumped up and ready to go. So 12 guys go in, one from each tribe, and they spend 40 days exploring the land. And when they came back, the nation gathers. And in, in, my, in the mind movie I make of this, you've got all the people out in this kind of flat area, and there's this stage, and the 12, the 12 spies are up on the stage. And they say, everything is exactly the way God said it would be. It really is a land flowing with milk and honey. And the people cheered. And they go, look at these grapes we found in the land of Canaan. They're as big as basketballs. And the people cheered. And they said, the spies said, there are pomegranates everywhere. And they're high in antioxidants. It's an awesome, beautiful, fertile land. And the crowd goes wild. And then the leader said, but we we can't do it. We can't take it. One of the men who explored that land, one of the 12, was Caleb, the guy that we met earlier in Joshua 14. He's standing up there on stage, and like everybody else, he's cheering and nodding his head as the spokesperson for the spies tells him how awesome it is. But then when he finally says, we can't do it, Caleb stops nodding his head. And he, uh, he grabs the mic and he, for the guy that's been talking, and he says, what do you mean we can't do it? Yes, we can. Now, I want you to look at Numbers chapter 13, verse 31. Something happens in this story. And this happens all the time. It happens in your company. It happens in your school. It happens in your house. It happens in your church. Anytime a group or an organization or a team or even an individual 
is trying to accomplish something out of the ordinary. Anytime we decide we want to live an astonishing life, not an average life, there's always somebody who says it can't be done. And here's what happens. Numbers chapter 13, verses 31. I'm going to read to verse 2 of chapter 14. But the men who had gone up with Caleb said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread a bad report. They spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Now I want you to pay attention to what they said. Here's what they said. The land we explored devours the people living in it. If you live in that land, the land is just going to eat you alive. The land is carnivorous. Then Then they said... All the people that we saw there are of great size. The land devours all the people, but all the people we saw are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak who came from the Nephilim, giants. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. This is chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Verse 2. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Ten people. Joshua and Caleb were the only two spies that said, we can do this. The other ten, ten people, just ten, caused an entire nation of hundreds of thousands to doubt a clear, unambiguous promise from the God who had done more than enough to demonstrate his faithfulness. And that was before social media. Every Israelite bought that bad report. Every one of them, five times in the next 10 verses in chapter 14 of Numbers, it says that all the people lost heart. The old broadcasting adage goes, if it bleeds, it leads. Why is it that 200 million people can successfully make it to work without rousing the interest of law enforcement. But all we hear about is one driver in Los Angeles who leads the place on a 100-mile-per-hour chase. Why is it we never hear about the 95% of homeowners who are current on their mortgages instead of the 5% who are behind? And so far this year, 193,074 of us who live in Huntsville have managed not to commit a murder. The five who did kill somebody, however, are the ones who made the news. Why Why is it? Because bad news is sticky. Good news, not so much. Which is why when you hear something bad about somebody, even if you know it's true, we have a really hard time letting that go. Just kind of worms its way into our heads, and then the next time we see them, we go, you know, I remember I heard something bad about them. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. Bad, bad news is sticky. I think that's one of the reasons God has laws about that. Ephesians 2, 29, 4, 29. You should write yourself a note on this one. Send yourself a text. Open up your device and mark this passage. This is a good one. Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only... What is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it might benefit those who listen. Is, is, is what I'm saying going to benefit those who listen to me? Everything we say ought to be strained through that verse. The trash talk from the 10 did not pass the benefit those who listen test. In a matter of hours, the entire nation was ready to head back to Egypt and resume their cushy lives of slavery. They were ready to stone Moses, and God was ready to start over. As that story continues to unfold, God says, that's it, I'm done. And Moses says, God, you you can't be done. He prays for them, and God forgives, which is what God does. But what happens next is a really bitter lesson for them, and it'll be for us too, but it's the truth. Pardon, P-A-R-D-O-N, pardon, does not necessarily mean there will be no punishment. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean you will not face consequences. 
because they did not trust the promise, that promise that God had given them of entering the, the promised land was revoked. No one over the age of 20 got to see the promised land. No one except two, Joshua and Caleb. Listen to what God says about Caleb in Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land that he went to and his descendants will inherit it. When I, when I read a story like this one, I always try to find myself in the characters. You do that? It's a really good way to study the Bible. It, it, it kind of helps it become more real and personal. So I try to see which character I'm like in a story like this. And if I can discover enough similarities between me and that character or those characters, then I figure, and, 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 and if my situation is similar to theirs, then God's word to them is God's word to me. Now, the danger of doing that, of course, is that I'm always the good guy when I do that. Remember the story about the Good Samaritan? There was this guy who was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and some thieves, some thugs came and beat him up, left him half dead, and stole all his stuff. And three other guys come by and see him. Three, three people pass by to see him, and only one of the people stopped. One of them was a priest. And so you're thinking, hey, priest, preacher, maybe that's your. Not, they're not the same thing. That's not me. Then there was the Levite. That's just a guy that works at a church. I'm a preacher, and we all know that preachers don't work, so that's not me. Right? <laughs> then there's the Samaritan. That's the one who stopped. That's the one Jesus commended. And I'm like, that's me. I'm that guy. Except... He was from a marginalized community. A white guy here, I'm not really marginalized. He was powerless. I'm not really powerless. He was despised and looked down on. I know there's some people that don't like me, but for the most part, I'm not despised and looked down on. I'm not the good guy in this story. Probably not really the priest either, and I'm not the Levite. I think I'm probably the guy that got beat up right? I tried to be the hero in the story of Caleb. You know, then I remembered lots of times when the crowd went one way, and I went that way too. You guys ever do that? You, everybody's doing a thing you know is wrong, but you do it too? Or nobody's doing the right thing, and you don't do it either? I, I do that sometimes. And, and then there are times, I remember lots of times when when instead of trusting God to be true to his promises, I took matters into my own hands and tried to control them. You guys ever do that? You know, I know God said he's got this. I know he cast all your anxiety upon him for he careth for you. I know that he's there, but I kind of need to take control of this myself because God's not doing a real good job of managing it. There are times when I grumbled and complained instead of trusted and obeyed. Do you ever do that? Complain and grumble and undermine the health, emotional, spiritual health of the community or a school or a house. There are times when I did not make the decision that would have dramatically changed my life. I'm not the hero in this story either. And then I looked at the 10 who spread the bad report and the tens of thousands who believed it, and I realized there are a lot of similarities between them and me. They were God's chosen people. Peter says, that's what I am. That's what you are. We are. They had been rescued from the enemy. Paul says that you and I have been rescued from the dominion of darkness. They had been forgiven. I've been forgiven. You've been forgiven if you're a Christian. They had been redeemed from slavery. Paul says, we have been redeemed. They were saved by God's grace. We have been saved by the same God same grace. They were delivered, chosen, rescued, forgiven, redeemed, and saved just like us. Yet when they had the chance to rise above average and live astonishing lives, when they had the chance to live dramatically different lives, they made the wrong call on the most important decision any of us will face. What is that decision? The decision is whether you will follow God. It's multiple choice. Whether you will follow God wholeheartedly, half-heartedly, 
or not at all. There are many who will decide they are not going to follow God at all. And if we're being honest, they're probably not in this room this morning. Sunday church, unfortunately, is largely made up of folks who are interested in following God to some degree. I wish we would fill our house, his house, this house, with doubters and disbelievers every Sunday. But for the most part, these are folks, we are folks, who are going to follow God. So it's really a question of intensity. The folks back in Numbers 13 decided to just settle for salvation. One day, I really believe this, one day I believe we will see those folks in heaven. God said, I forgave them. But for the next 40 years, they lived mundane, monotonous, and meaningless lives, and they died one by one in the desert. They received a promise from God. They saw his glory. They heard his voice. They experienced his presence. They walked right up to the edge of adventure, to the verge of astonishing, and they said, that's close enough. Don't want to go any further. We can choose to do that, and we'll get to heaven. There will be consequences, though. We will live like they lived, and then we will die. Caleb was different. He had a different spirit. He served and followed God, and it comes up three times there in Judges chapter 14. It comes up once back in Numbers 13. He served and followed God wholeheartedly. He followed God with his whole heart. He decided to live an astonishing life. He'll be in heaven too, but he'll have a better story. I want to have a better story. I want to follow God wholeheartedly. I'm telling you right now, I don't always do it. So I need you to hold me to that, even as I hold you to it. If there is a God behind this amazing creation, he is an awesome and amazing God. And right after I wrote that sentence this morning, it thundered really loud. And I decided to leave that sentence in. I thought, okay, God punctuated it, I'm going to leave it. There is a God. He is amazing. And if we will follow him with all our hearts, we can live amazing, astonishing lives, not because of who we are, not because of what we do, but because of who he, who he is and what he has done and what he will do through us, what he will do through wholehearted followers. Let's do that this week. Can we do that? Let's do it. Let's stand. Let's sing. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted his skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great mind. There is a God, there is a God. He, is he is alive, in him we live, in we live. And, we and we survive. From dust our God, created man, he is our God. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, is a God. He, is he is alive, in him we live, in we live. And, we and we survive. From dust our God, created man, he is our God, the upon a tree a life was willing there to give that he from sin might set man free and evermore with him could live there is a God
Church of Christ National Anthem right there. <laughs> and not that old. It's younger than I am. 1966. Anyway, point of interest for you. Thanks for being here. Great morning together. As always, don't forget things coming up that are listed in your bulletin, events and things about the family here, like showers and Bible studies. And especially this morning, let me highlight the HICLC Give It Back track. Uh, that's coming up on May the 12th. A lot of ways that you could help them in the good work that they do by sponsoring a child or by running in that event or both or whatever. Uh, but please remember that coming up. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for being here, and we're going to close in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, as we leave here today, we just ask that you give us strength, help us to be courageous so we can live with a different spirit and we can follow you wholeheartedly this week. Help us to go out and, and share with those around us the hope we have because you are alive, because you sent your son to save us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.